G'day guys, welcome to Talking Maggot Kin of Nurgle. You are here with the coach and I have a very special guest. It is the legend of Math Hammer. He's come straight out of the mean streets of Radio Free Hammer Hall. It is Paul Conti. G'day Paul, welcome to the show. Let's talk Nurgle. What's up nerds? The grandfather has come to bless you. What's up, nerds? Indeed. I'm glad we got that catchphrase. It is probably one of the hottest catchphrases in Age of Sigma. Um, Paul Conti is an absolute legend of the community. People would know him uh, a main free Cities of Sigma player, but he's traded all, all, all in. He's a part of Nurgle's Blight. He lives in the Garden of Nurgle. He's been given uh, the Papa's Blessing, and we are going to talk about Nurgle. Uh, very on-demand yeah. show, actually. People have been harassing me going, oh, when are you going to do another Nurgle show? When are you do another Nurgle show? And it's actually a really good time, I think. While we've got Broken Realms coming and who knows how Nurgle is going to be inf uh, affected. I was going to say infected, which would be actually the same thing. Um, yeah. We had some good stuff come out. Uh, General's Handbook was quite pleasant for you guys. Uh, yeah. You know, Wrath of the Everchosen. 2020 has been a great year for Nurgle. Uh, it's probably a good time to revisit Nurgle and look at some lists on how players might want to start building. Again, obviously, Broken Realms might be coming out and that might change our conversation. But uh, Paul has got two lists for us we're going to unpack in a minute. Yes. So I think Nurgle is actually in a really good place right now in terms of kind of being like a counter meta sort of army. Um, one of the big things that you see a lot of right now is a lot of shooting and a lot of mortal wound spam at range. Um, Nurgle has a lot of mortal wound saves and a lot of debuffs to shooting, a lot of redundant saves. So you have a lot of resilience against those things that are really hot in the meta right now. Um, and it has a lot of flexibility in the army because it's, you know, it's a god-marked army. So you have the flexibility to grab Slaves to Darkness or uh, Beasts of Chaos. Uh, you, there's some Skaven Pestilence that you can take. There's some stuff from Forward World you can take. There, There's a huge array of War Scrolls that you have available to you. So there's, you know, th there's always a new angle that you can take on whatever is going on in the metagame. And by God, Mark, uh, Paul is referring to the fact that um, you are not landlocked into this particular battle tome. You're not landlocked to Maggot Kin of Nurgle. Uh, there is a lot of cool battle tomes that allow you to mark uh, a Chaos God. So your Chaos Warriors are a perfect example that can yep. be given, while they are Slaves to Darkness unit, they can be given the Nurgle keyword, which then brings them into the fold to generate uh, a whole bunch of cool rules that might be sitting in your book. You can also tap into, as you've mentioned, Skaven. Uh, you can tap into uh, Beast of Chaos. Um, you've got the Wrath of the Ever Chosen, that supplement as well. While it doesn't come with models, it comes with rules. And um, it's much like Cities of Sigma, where um, you have a giant toolbox that you're able to tap into. And I think that's what's really cool about the Chaos Armies. Uh, especially armies um, like Nurgle, where you can tap into Plague Monks if you want Hordes. You have the elite Blight Kings. You've got some big monsters in the Great Unclean Ones. You've got your Flyers, which is your um, your Plague Drones. Uh, no matter which way you want to go, you want to kind of ignore Bravery, you've got a whole bunch of Plague Bearers. You, whatever you want to do, it is a, a benefit and a curse because you can get into, like, list paralysis trying to work out how do I put a 2K list together? And it's cool that Paul has actually given us two lists as an example that we will go through um, once we go through the rules. Yeah. And it's, you know, with uh, all of the COVID lockdowns and all of that that we have going on and the difficulty it is to get out there and hobby, if you're a Nurgle player, you have a lot of opportunity to take up some of your hobby time that you might be otherwise spending playing a game uh, just sitting with War Scroll Builder and building list after list after list after list after list and refining things. And eventually you uh, get to be like Tom from Warhammer Weekly, who has like a million lists in every permutation of the army. Oh, he's made up every list on the internet, to be fair. Um, but it also yeah. can be it, it also can be very damaging because I know the trap for me in Cities of Sigmar is I'll build out a really cool army, let's say primarily humans. But then I'm like, oh, what if I bring in Iron Drakes? 
Or what if I was to bring in uh, an elf unit and then all of a sudden the synergies take me down a different complete rabbit hole. So uh, again, it is a, a blessing and a curse that you can tap into this book, but I think know that you can move with the meta no matter how the meta goes, whether it's at a local, whether it's at a national level, um, you have majority of the tools. But instead of me explaining the tools and the benefits, what drew you to the army? Why did you jump from the cities of Sigma into Nurgle? And why have you stayed here? Probably longer than I expected you to stay here, to be honest with you. Uh, the big thing is exactly what you said it's a toolbox army and i think it is a toolbox army that lends itself even more to my personal play style and preferences than cities of sigmar does i still have my cities on the shelf still pull them out and play them um you know one of my other larger armies is skaven another toolbox army um so that's the thing that really attracted me like when i first saw the the cycle of contagion that you have seven, seven different allegiance abilities and you get a different buff on different turns and you have a spell that you can cast to change what your effect is. That really drew me in very quickly. And then looking at the units and what was there, um, I have definitely, after playing way too much Cities of Sigmar, I've gotten away from wanting high model count so it's generally a low model count army. It's big beefy dudes. Um, and it's, I, I'm one of those people that I just love the, the aesthetic of the army as well. I love the grossness. It, they're really fun to paint. Um, I, I mean, I'm like, it, once I run out of Nurgle stuff to paint, I'm going to start picking up Death Guard. You know, because I, I, I just love the general aesthetic that much. I think for me, like when I look at Nurgle range, there's a lot of cool things you can do. And um, I've been really enjoying this year, 2020, um, I've really enjoyed kit bashing and converting. And Nurgle kind of falls into that theme, same theme for me because uh, it is disgusting. It can be, uh, you know, very different colors. You know, if you look at things like pus and blood and boils, you know, you could do some very interesting color schemes, but then there are companies like Green Stuff World not being sponsored here, but things like Green Stuff World who actually have tools that allow you to get Green Stuff rollers for tentacles and you can build out some very interesting conversions. I've seen some awesome Nurgle conversions for the Gargant War Stomper, you know, cutting them up and, you know, I think it's a converter's dream and it's very forgiving as well because you just throw on some some blood, some guts, some um, you know, just some some bile and some things, and and hide um, any of those mistakes. Or it doesn't have to be pretty. It's not a pretty army. So um, I really like it, and it's got the tools, as you said. It's got summoning. It's got fast movement. It's got a little terrain piece. It's not a massive terrain piece. You've got a little one. You use uh, it as much or as little. It's a really very good one. It's I think. <laughs> In ter like all things put together, I think for a terrain piece for an army, the Feculent Gnarlmaw that Nurgle has is probably one of the best terrain pieces. Yeah, yeah, it's very good. It, it's very good. I was talking purely about the size and compared to bringing right. like a bunch of Wildwoods or a bunch of, I don't know, the Bone Tithe Nexus. But yes, right. you're right. It's a very usable terrain piece and uh, it does really hide one of your, your weaknesses, which is a baseline movement, uh, quite a low one, uh, but then it kind of supercharges that. But I think Nurgle's really cool. Um, this is not a propaganda episode. This is a list talking episode. I don't need to sell you if you're watching this episode. Or maybe, maybe, maybe you are thinking about getting into Nurgle. So instead of doing all the propaganda of why you should be taking on uh, Papa Nurgle's blessing, Let's talk about the rules. Let's talk about why you would build this allegiance and what you'd get that that dollar uh, bang for your buck is where I was trying to go with this, Paul. Um, yeah. My gosh. So let's talk Nurgle. We're opening up our uh, Maggot Kid of Nurgle book to get a whole bunch of allegiances. I did say that you've got your Slaves to Darkness, your Wrathy the Ever Chosen, you've got your Skaven Tide, but we're going to draw this from the allegiances in Maggot Kid of Nurgle. What do I get for being Nurgle? Your biggest thing that you get right off the rip is the cycle of corruption. That is the wheel that many people have probably seen around. It has uh, seven different 
uh, options on that wheel. You roll a D6 at the start of the game to determine uh, which um, stage of the cycle that you're going to start on. Uh, and it advances forward one uh, one place on the cycle for uh, each battle round. So one goes to two, two goes to three, or if you roll a dice and it starts at four, four goes to five, five goes to six, six goes to one. I assume once you go to six, you you the wheel goes back to the start. There is actually a seven, and it goes it it does go seven back to one. But you'll notice there's a reason they did very good design on this. Why the number seven? Seven is first of all Nurgle's holy number. Um, it is one more than a D6 can do. And that one spot is uh, healing D3 wounds to all of your units, which is completely useless if you roll that on your first turn. So I thought that was a, a really nice little bit of design that they threw in there that this is like we're going to make number seven, the one that you can't get on the die roll, a thing that's useless to you on turn one anyway. And what's really helpful, guys, is that there's also ways to manipulate the the, the roll. So if you're sitting there going, right, I've rolled a one, there's literally no way for me to get to the corrupted regrowth. Uh, that's wrong. Uh, there are ways to manipulate the wheel that we will talk through in a very minute. But for anyone who's listening to the podcast who can't see the visuals, the different cycles of corruption. Um, so as Paul mentioned, you roll a dice and that is where you start on the first battle round. And then that changes unless you manipulate. But the rules are you've got one unnatural vitality. So you add plus two to the movement characteristic of Nurgle units. That's really cool. You've got a uh, add one to the wound rolls for all attacks made by Nurgle in the combat phase. Again, very good. There's not a lot of debuffing wound rolls. There's not a lot of ways to increase wound rolls. So that is a very good benefit to me. Um, Roll a dice for each unit within one inch of a terrain feature at the start of your hero phase on a five. Uh, the su it suffers one mortal wound, and if it's Nurgle, it gets to heal one wound, which is, again, nice to be able to do some damage with the amount of terrain on the table. But then on the flip side, heal some of your guys. doesn't bring back a body, so if you've got, um, let's say, a, a unit of Plague Bearers, which are one wound models, you don't regenerate. You don't regenerate. You just heal. So good for things like Black Kings, I imagine, um, those multi rune heroes, Paul. Yep, exactly. You heal up your Blight Kings, heal up your drones, your great unclean ones. Uh, it It is, you know, I've heard some Nurgle players kind of poo poo that particular um, stop on the cycle. And I, I have had nothing but good results from it. It's just a nice sprinkling of mortal wounds around the board, nice little sprinkling of healing around the board. I guess it wasn't that long ago that we saw things like Thricefall Battalion, so three big uh, great unclean ones plus a horde of, uh, of plague bearers. So I imagine healing one wound on your plague bearers is useless. Uh, one wound on the great unclean one is nice but not game-changing. Um, right. But when we start moving into what I guess the meta looks like now for Nurgle, which is uh, probably more of the Black King build, yeah, th this right. makes a huge difference. So it, it, it's, it just doubles in value. Yeah. And I, I have to say, I played Thricefold Befoulement for the first time ever last weekend. It was so much fun. <laughs> I got beat so bad because I didn't know what I was doing, but it was a lot. I used to play a lot against Th Thricefold became a real big thing in Australia for a while. Uh, people like Gemma Shepherd, um, Ben Camden Smith, there's a whole bunch of really good players running around with Thricefold. And when you got bogged down by a couple of big blocks of say 30 and 20 plague bearers, in addition to, you know, the triple, triple great unclean ones doing their, you know, the spells and cutting themselves to get boosts. Uh, it was a very tough nut to crack, but that has changed a little bit. And, um, who knows, maybe one of your list, Paul, will include the Thricefall Battalion. Uh, I guess listeners will just have to wait and see. Um, yeah. Before I jump into the other ones, yeah. I might as well, we, you might as well share your thoughts. Like, what are your thoughts on the plus two movement, the plus one to the wound, um, and you've obviously just mentioned the, the th thoughts on healing or the damage. Um, the plus two movement is incredibly powerful. Um, this army in general has a lot of surprise speed and getting that plus two movement at the right time is it, it can be, be completely game changing. Um, if I was to roll that, if I was to get 
that part of the wheel, I don't know, late game, is that useless? Or do you think there's still value in the plus two movement in the late game? Because I imagine that's something that people would want in the first turn. Like They would be praying for that in the first turn. Yeah, and what I find is I actually prefer it mid to late game. And the big reason for that is when you have fewer models on the board and you get yourself into a weird position and your opponent, you know, because it's Nurgle, it seems to just have this psychological effect that Nurgle is slow. And with the Feculent Gnarl Maw letting you run in charge, you can get that plus two movement on top of a run of six with a command point, plus one from your uh, Blight King's Musician. Uh, and then if you're near uh, Feculent Gnarl Maw, then you can charge. That can take you a massive distance across the board. And... Uh, you know, contest an objective that your opponent thought was safe. And that really is very, very important, I think. Um, also, adding on to like Puscoil Blight Lords, giving them even more movement. Um, the Lord of Afflictions has a command ability that gives them plus eight movement. Um, and adding an extra two on to that with, you know, a run in addition get puts them up to like a 24 inch range threat before they charge i guess in the late game i imagine this would be beneficial because you don't have to rely on on uh, summoning more feculent now more terrain pieces uh to slingshot yourself around the board in the late game you can keep that in your pocket to bring out some models i'm not going to talk about them just yet we'll talk about something in a minute but it allows you to keep those those points uh, for models as opposed to more trees just to get you across the board faster right and nurgle is not really an alpha strike army it's really much more counter punchy and very defensive so if you get that plus two on the first turn you know there's certain nurgle builds where like you can pull off an alpha strike and do a lot of damage, but that's not necessarily what you want to do. Um, usually you're going to be playing a lot more cagey than that. Um, the next uh, stop on the cycle, Feck and Vigor, plus one to wound, it, that just, um, it really amplifies your offensive power significantly. Like, it, I mean, plus one to hit, plus one to wound, always does a lot and this is doing it to your entire army yeah that's massive that is massive and again um the it, it is hard to boost wounds there are very few things that will debuff your wound characteristic you know the frost phoenix being one of those but outside of that you know any way you can bring that wound roll down um is just wonderful so uh, getting that at the right time uh, is critical. Getting that turn one is probably not as effective as maybe a turn two to turn three. But uh, And this is where you maybe you want to start considering how you manipulate the wheel so it's a bit more favorable uh, and when you get things at a certain time. Not you can always guarantee it, but uh, it's good to, to have um, some tools up the toolbox. Yeah. Uh, what I would say is for my initial role, most of the time, my ideal role is going to be a five for Nauseous Revulsions. So that makes your opponent re-roll wound rolls of six against you. There's a bunch of effects that um, you get some sort of bonus on a wound roll of six. My, my Grotz, for example, can do mortal wounds on a six. Uh, there's a lot of there is a lot of uh, armies that have a mortal wound or additional rend or additional damage uh, on a trigger of a six. So that that's yep. awesome. That allows you to um, mitigate some of that. Right, and the in addition to that, it sets you up really well for how your game goes, and you don't necessarily even need to manipulate the wheel further. You can just let it flow from there and it'll often flow just the way you want the game to because then your next stop would be rampant disease and you're doing d3 mortal wounds to d3 enemy units and you don't need line of sight from anything it's anywhere on the board no range so you're just spitting mortal wounds down um, there's a couple of other things in the army that have similar abilities 
So it really stacks up nicely that, you know, you can really snipe out some enemy heroes. Those little five wound guys that uh, like to buff people's armies are really vulnerable to stuff like rampant disease and um, Rodigus's spell and uh, plague squall. Like there's a lot of options to get that little bit of range damage over there in a very targeted way. And Nurgle, Nurgle feels thematic in a way that uh, there's very, very few opportunities that you just literally straight out like six damage, you know. Um, it's not like a corn army. It's rather, again, very, very what you'd expect from an army that's full of uh, rotting and disease and this slow, slow degradation that you do a lot of chip damage to heroes, chip damage, damage yeah. to models, and you bring that down over time. Uh, it'd, be, it'd be a um, a shame if we missed the. We, we kind of jumped one a little bit. That. Yeah. Um, it could, it can be useful depending on who you face. The first thing I think about is Zench, for example, right. uh, and certainly not the only one. But uh, the the Plague of Misery rerolling battle shock tests of one for enemy units, excluding Nurgle. And there are a few summoning armies that, on a roll of a one, they will bring back bodies. But also, uh, there's a lot of armies like Cities of Sigma, for example, or or Grotz, who have low bravery. And when you start thinking about some of the debuffs, some damage that you're going to start doing. Um, Forcing that reroll one uh, can be hurtful. It can, and battle shock is often a thing that we don't even really think about or talk about that much because there's so many ways around battle shock immunity, uh, or I'm sorry, to get battle shock immunity, I should say. Um, but you know, this is certainly a thing that can be useful if you're playing against Zinch sweet Moses, do you want to have this to stop those pink horrors from regenerating? Um, what, what, one thing to consider, though, is that, um, yeah, yeah. It, it also might, sorry, where I was going to go with this was that it also might force the decision for an opponent to who wouldn't normally use a command point for inspiring presence. They might go, oh, this is too right. much of a risk. Uh, if I roll, you know, I, I'll just I'll just use inspiring presence. So you suck that out and, uh, and again, you know, you've got the sustainability. You're able to really uh, suck up that damage and um, and play towards the late game. I think this army is definitely a five turn type army, as opposed to you know um, going out there for turn one, turn two, and then it's just like this slippery slope. So right. the 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 re rolling ones can be can be brutal. Some armies I just don't yeah. going to care about that at all. They're going to so what? Um, Seraphon yeah. are going to go. Eh, who cares? But uh, there are some yeah. armies that trigger battle shock or uh hey maybe they don't have a command point up their sleeve so um you could make them have some really tough questions to answer uh, i certainly wouldn't want I, my gargans don't have many command points and if i if i fail a battle shock test with a gargant that could be a 12 wound gargant 200 points running away from one failed battle shock so um and i don't have many ways to generate command points but hey this is not the the sons of behemoth show this is the noble show you got rampant disease, as you mentioned, the mortal wound damage. Uh, pick a pick a hero. Uh, start the hero phase. Pick three different units, uh, excluding Nurgle, within twelve uh, of each other. Uh, they and they suffer D three mortal wounds. So that's pretty cool. Yep. And, and then there's the the healing. The Nurgle units heal D three at the start of their hero at their hero phase. Yep. And one thing that I did want to call out real quick that you mentioned that Nurgle is very much a five turn army that you're in the game for the whole game. Um, from a competitive standpoint, that can become a little bit of a liability sometimes because the games just run long because you're very durable yeah. and you have some good offensive power, but it's you're not like a glass cannon. So you're more eroding your opponent down slowly and playing that game of attrition where they're losing stuff faster than you are. Um, but a lot of Nurgle games are going to go to time in a tournament. I, I would agree. My, my whole experience against Nurgle um, at competitive tournaments, they normally go till the end. Uh, I know as an opponent, it's been very hard to defend against Nurgle. There's been plenty of times where my opponent has cast, not cast, summoned, which funnily enough is what leads us now, uh, you know, bringing on those cheeky 10 uh, plague bearers, those five plague bearers to contest or score an objective in the late game. So 
Um, as the attrition kind of starts happening and my army starts to shrink or it kind of gets into the uh, middle of the table or wherever the battle might be taking, uh, that ability to be able to bring on additional units uh, can't be underestimated. So this is another thing that you guys are going to get. You get a version of summoning. So um, yes. basically, Paul, explain to me, how do I summon? Because it's not like Slanesh where you do depravity, uh, which is, you know, wounds taken or wounds suffered. It's not corn. It's not about units destroyed. How do you get your points? Um, our points are really based around board presence. You get um, three contagion points in your hero phase for uh, being having troops in your own territory, three more for having troops in your opponent's territory, um, an additional one point um, if you are in a territory unopposed, and then your feculent gnarl maws give you an additional d3 if there's no enemy units within uh, three inches of them. So you're not getting a ton of it. A lot of it can be controlled by your opponent uh, because it's relying on uh, player territory rather than uh, you know a player board half. It there are certain battle plans that are really bad for Nurgle in terms of summoning because you know you'll have a tiny part of the board that is enemy territory. So how do you get troops over there to have a presence in enemy territory to be accumulating significant contagion points? Um, so the interesting thing though is that Nurgle, I think makes a lot out of what little summoning that it can do. Mm -hmm. um, you're not relying on your summoning, but it is, everything in the army is kind of priced out almost like it's not there. So it's a good bonus. It's a good thing that your opponent might not think about necessarily. You know, you can have a lot of instances where you just all of a sudden, because your summoning is done at the end of the movement phase, you can move a hero somewhere and then just drop plague bearers onto an objective. Um, and your opponent would just not see it coming. Um, that sort of thing happens very frequently or in the, in the late game, especially, it's hard because you are so fixated in the battle. You're fixated on uh, positional play. You're thinking about, you know, where you want to strike first or how you're going to retreat. And, you know, you're thinking about all these things and you forget about the sneaky summon that might come off. So the hero, by the way, so you summon uh, your units from the Feculent Narmal or a friendly Nurgle hero, so long as it's within 12 inches of that Narmal or that hero, uh, and it must be outside of nine inches from the enemy. So uh, there are some tools. If nothing more, you've got some defensive things potentially from the Narmal, depending on where you put it. Um, but talk to me, Paul, about the units, because when I look at this, you know, they're quite generous. You know, you've got the Great Unclean one, you've got, you know, Plague Drones, Plague Bearers, big block of Plague Bearers, small block of Plague Bearers. You've got, you know, right. uh, a Nurgling base. You've got, you know, some heroes, whether it's Sloppity Bile Paper, Piper or whatever it might be. Um, are all of them valuable in your opinion? Are they are they things that you, you know, strive to save up for a, a free Great Unclean one? Is it something that you kind of just rapid firing and getting out those Nurgle bases or those five plague bearers as quick as you can? What's your thinking? And I know this will change upon scenario and opponents, but just some very high level thinking around summoning. Um, I would say most commonly the number one thing on this chart that I will do is spend seven contagion points for five plague bearers. Um, that just puts bodies somewhere. It's on an objective. It's a screen. It's um, just getting an extra body count on an objective to hold it better. Um, there's, it's very useful and it's not a lot, but you know, it it being a screen that forces your opponent to have to beat through them or go around them. And they're on 32 millimeter bases and five is a decent number of them to take up some board space and block off a path. So your opponent has to either deal with this crappy little unit or find a way around it. Um, the Feculent Gnarl Maw, I think, is a trap for a lot of people. I hear a lot of people say, oh, uh, first thing I summon is a feculent Gnarl Maw. 
The math on that does not work out well. Um, since you're only getting D3 potentially from each one every turn. And the first one that you summon is not going to give you contagion points in the first battle round. So you at maximum have four battle rounds of getting D3 contagion, which averages out to eight contagion points over the whole game. Mm. And it costs you seven to do it. So you're net plus one on turn five. That's not where you want to be. Um, but the flip side of the Feculent Gnarl Maw is that I do summon them. And I summon them because within seven inches of them, you can run and charge. Mm. And you can set up situations where you know you move a hero out somewhere, then you drop a feculent gnarl maw within 12 inches of that, then you've got a unit that was now like 19 inches away from this hero that can run in charge. Um, and it's for seven contagion points. And you do hear Nurgle players talk a lot about this concept called a slingshot. You know, you basically, you run up to this uh, feculent gnarl maw, and we'll talk about the feculent gnarl maw in a second. It's literally the next page. But, you know, I, I, I agree with you. Uh, I think it is probably a trap. I think the five Plague Bearers is a better uh, a better investment than trying to put down a Feculent Narmor. Uh, I know most of my Nurgle players, uh, when, I've, when I've gone up against them, they have either just dropped five Plague Bearers every chance that they could. So the minute they get to seven, they just spit out five. Uh, to either just be screens, to either to be going for objectives, just to be generally annoying, or they'll save up for a big block of 10 or 20, and usually that's a late game, whether it's defending their home objective, maybe they're losing the battle and they want a second line of defence, or they will uh, be going to to summon these uh, and go for a late game while the battle is shrinking and, you know, damage is really being caused. Um I've never seen a hero, whether it's a Poxbringer, a Bile Piper, I've never seen any of the heroes brought on the table. Um, and I've never seen a great unclean one summoned. I, I, I just find most Nurgle players that I've been I, I've been fighting uh, seem to be Plague Bearer. That's their, that's their key. Right. The, the Plague Bearers are usually the thing that you're going to go to almost every time. Um, doing a group of 20 Plague Bearers is actually a discount compared to the I was five. just looking at that I was just looking at that because uh, five is seven 10 is 14 uh technically if you were gonna get 20 it would be uh what's that uh, 28 mm -hmm. uh but you're gonna get it uh for 20 21 sorry so uh it is a discount yeah so and when plague bearers have 20 or more models in the unit they're minus one to hit um so if you need a it, they're a good defensive block to save up for um also if you're getting towards the late game you have been accumulating contagion points i like to be very frugal with my contagion points i don't like to just spend 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 i like to use them as i need them and i've come up on many instances where i get to turn four and i'm like i need another hammer unit and i summon plague drones they're not a really good hammer unit, but I will say that I have gotten a clutch scenario where I summoned plague drones and they killed Marathi. So I'm happy with it. Like it works sometimes. It's, you know, uh, I'm never going to show up to an event or show up to a game without some plague drones in my box ready to go without a whole bunch of plague bearers without an extra feculent gnarl maw. I'm, I think I might get a third feculent gnarl maw uh, just because I've had some situations where I'm like, you know, summoning a second one might be a cool trick right now. Um, it's that kind of corner case situation that, you know, if you're, if you're playing a casual game, who cares? But if you're playing competitively, you you don't want to be in a position where you're like, man, I really need to summon a feculent normal, but I don't own enough yeah. of the model. 
I guess the point I wanted to make to everybody is you don't have to go out and buy a whole bunch of these extra as your summoning pool. You don't have to have all of them ready to go. But there are a couple of ones that I would definitely want in my toolbox. I'm hearing certainly having at least one additional feculent normal will give you options. Uh, you certainly want to have some plague bearers and potentially 10 to 20 additional plague bearers up your sleeve is probably enough, um, assuming that some of them are going to die. Uh, maybe a plague drone. Uh, could be quite useful as well. Um, yeah. And you know what's actually perfect for this is my advice to Nurgle players that are just getting started, buy the Start Collecting Nurgle Demons box. It is your summoning pool. It is everything you need. Except Grand Unclear 1, but you're not going to probably summon that. It's probably very, very, very unlikely. I, I think... I, I have never crap. summoned a great unclean one. I have never known anyone that has summoned a great I've never unclean heard a, I've never heard anyone summon a great unclean one. It sounds wonderful. Uh, it sounds amazing, but I've never seen it. I think, um, I think you're better off summoning your, your plague bearers, just in my opinion. Yep. It, it, plague bearers, uh, you know, if you're a new player and you're limited on models, you know, some nurglings could be valuable. In some of the new scenarios too, though, I want to point out, Summoning one of those heralds could actually be good because it's another hero that can give you bonus points on objectives in certain scenarios. Yeah, there there are new some there are you're right there are some scenarios that give you bonus points for having a hero within six inches of the objective. So actually, you know what? Now that we have that rule, uh, maybe we will see a few because you're probably not going to go out and get sloppy ball piper in your two K list, but it could be a, a, a useful uh, tool to bring to the table. Yeah. Um, now we talked a little bit about the feculent Narmor. I think it, it's pretty self uh, You know, it, it's it's an easy war scroll. It's self-contained. It's not it's not too crazy. You know, a couple of key rules. It's it's quite a small base again. You know, when you think about it versus, I don't yes. know, the Seraphine or the you know the Bone Tide Nexus or whatever it might be. But the two really cool rules that uh, that you're going to get, and we talked about the slingshot. Uh, one is you're going to in the charge phase Nurgle units that are within seven inches, not wholly just within seven of a feculent Narmor can attempt to a charge even if they ran in the same turn. We've already sp spoken about how good this is. Anything you'd, you'd want else you'd want to add about that? Uh, other than probably the best rule in the army. Um, that's about it. Like it's pretty self-explanatory. Getting stuff to run in charge is big. So my advice to everybody who's who's picking up this book, if you're new to Nurgle or you're just getting good, uh, really think about where you position your Feculent Narmor because you want to be able to either have a command point to burn so you get the guaranteed six to be able to then charge. Because the last thing you want is, is I say, the last thing you don't want is to miss out being within seven and then your whole strategy collapses because you wanted to slingshot, you wanted to throw in a certain unit and, and tie up your opponent for a couple of rounds. Um, get good at maths when it comes to your Narmor and know your distances. Paul, is that would, would you uh, agree with that? I definitely agree. Um, I am it, I am of the, the school of feculent Narmors that say pretty much always put it right in the middle. So smack bang in the center? Uh, almost all the time. Um, there's some situations, depending on terrain placement and your list, where you might skew it a little bit differently. Um, you have to put it down before you pick table sides. Mm. So that is definitely a challenge. Um, Especially for something like a Bone Tide Nexus, for example, which I've referred to earlier, which also gets deployed before the, the, uh, the side's picked. So um, I guess really keep in mind where you're putting the tree and then deploy with that in mind. Yep, exactly. Um, and being in the center, it's a decent enough size model that you're getting a, a good radius around it. So it, you know, and you have the option to summon more. And that's an important thing to keep in mind too, is that you can always do the su surprise, drop one, and then uh, charge off. The other rule that you're going to get, which is a nice to have, it's not game breaking, but it is nice to have, is that at the start of the hero phase, you roll a dice for each unit within three inches of the feculent Narmor. On a four plus, the Nurgle, sorry, the unit suffers one mortal wound, so your opponent is going to suffer one mortal wound by being within three. Uh, units with the Nurgle keyword are unaffected by this ability, so yeah. um, not bad, not bad. It can be annoying, you know, it could do some chip damage to uh, an opponent, uh, especially a hero. 
um, that's within three, or it could be a deterrent to keep people away from your feculent normal. Right, exactly. And I find that for some reason, it's just enough to keep people away from your feculent normal maw. And being within three inches of the feculent normal maw turns off the D3 contagion points that you get from it. So it's just enough of a deterrent that your opponent's going to make the wrong choice and let you have more contagion points. For me, whenever I see the feculent normal as an opponent, I'm happy to be within three because I'd rather take the mortal wound than give away the additional points. And that could be the difference between you summoning this turn or next turn. Um, yes. But yeah, keep that in mind if you are the Nurgle player. Um, it's like damned if you do, damned if you don't. Mortal wound or you're getting depravity, not depravity. Um, uh, what's your points called? Not Contag depravity. Contag contagion points. Yeah. Look at me go far out. Uh, cool. Uh, anything else you want to talk about well, before we get into the, the two lists? Uh, no, not really. Um, I would say overall, uh, the book has really good artifacts and spells and, um, a very powerful command trait. Um, there's a command trait that lets you once per game, move the cycle of contagion forward or back one stage. Um, so it's just an extra way to manipulate the cycle of corruption and it's once per game for free with no strings attached. Um, you know, your spell to change the stage is on a seven and all of your wizards know it. It's not like you have to dedicate a wizard to being the one to move the wheel. Um, you know, you have a lot of different avenues that you can go down in ways to go after your opponent, ways to debuff your opponent. Correct me if I'm wrong, Nurgle isn't the strongest uh, magic casting army. You don't have a lot of buffs other than your uh, your Great Unclean One cutting itself and getting additional casts. Is that correct? So, like, because yeah. I always find that Nurgle's casting outside of the Great Unclean One is rather inconsistent because you've got a yeah. high cast of seven and there's not a lot of ways to boost it other than Arcane Terrain or with the Great Unclean One. So I always found that it's a nice to have or you've got to really look for ways to kind of increase that ability. And I think maybe now with, you know, um, Techless, with some of these supercasters, the the Lord of Croaks, the, the Lord of Changes, uh, that could might that might be even harder to do now uh, in the new competitive scene um, without some tools. For sure. Um, you have, I would say, you have average magic. The yeah. spells are really good but your ability to cast them is very average. Yeah, yeah, I, look, there's been good spells that, yeah, I, I agree 100%. It's just inconsistent, um, it's certainly, and it's hard to get find, find ways to get consistent. It's gonna be, it, it, you know, if you see the arcane terrain on the table, that you have to go for it. You just have to go for it, just to get those little plus ones, plus two, it will be the difference. Um, right. So the first list that you've given me is a Bless Sons list. So we are now drawing, Paul mentioned earlier, that we can pull from uh, the Skaven book, the Beast of Chaos book. We can pull from Wrath of the Everchosen. This is one of the Wrath of the Everchosen um, sub-allegiances. So we still remain Nurgle, but we are sub-allegiance Blessed Sons. And what you're going to get for this, and Paul, I'll read out the rules. You tell me what it's all about and why it's good. The All ability right. you're going to get is Nurgle's Embrace. Roll a dice each time a friendly Blessed Sun Rotbringer model is slain in the combat phase. On a roll of a 2+, plus, the attacking unit suffers one mortal wound. If the attacking unit has a Nurgle keyword, it heals one mortal wound. Sorry, so it heals uh, one wound allocated to the unit instead. Yes, that is just more of like the Nurgle chip damage. There's little bits of mortal wounds here and there, and you slowly whittle down your opponent. Um, I had an incident with um, this particular rule. I had a unit of 10 Blight Kings that I charged into a Terror Geist. And the Blight Kings, you know, they went first. They did not kill the Terror Geist. But the Terror Geist doing damage back and killing Blight Kings 
bouncing those mortal wounds back as my guys died killed the terror geist. So what has, so obviously this is keyword dependent. So if I go blessed sons, blessed sons, blessed sons, blessed sons, yeah. if we go blessed sons, um, obviously the army gets the keyword. But talk to me about Rotbringer. So when I look at my war scrolls, you've mentioned uh, your, your Black Kings. Yep. What, what else is likely to have this keyword? I know I'm kind of throwing you under the bus with every single war scroll known to man, but what has the Rotbringer keyword? Uh, very simple. It is all of your war scrolls from the Maggotkin book that are not demons. All so of your our plague drones? Uh, your Pusquale Blight Lords, yep. but not the, the plague drones. Um, and then a significant number of your heroes, um, your Maggoth Lords, your Sorcerer. Lord and, of Affliction? Uh, yep. Lord of Affliction and Glotkin. Okay. All right. So if, we, if we're if we going to get this, we're going to do some mortal wounds back, um, which is yep. going to be pretty cool. If we're going to build, and uh, maybe this is an indicator that we're going to be building around the Black Kings. They did get a boost in the General's Handbook, a little bit yep. of a cheeky, cheeky discount. Um, any, anything else you want to add to the Nurgle's Embrace? Um, I think it's, it's really strong. Um, I would hesitate to run this if I was not going very heavy on rock bringers uh, like this whole host I, I if I'm not running you know in general a very heavy blight king list I'm not bringing this but having that there and popping those few extra mortal wounds is very useful as you said it could I'd either kill a hero it could degrade the behemoth's profile it could be the difference between battle shock and no battle shocks. You've done extra damage. Um, yep. It could stop a uh, a minor hero, a five wound hero, getting into combat because they don't want to be the one that, that takes that that what that mortal wound. So um, yep. it plays in a couple of different areas, which is pretty cool. Yeah. The command trait that you're going to get. So uh, the general uh, will get the following command trait. Once per turn, you can use at the double. So that's our run and that's our um, uh, run at six. Yep. So uh, at the double, command ability on friendly blessed sons rock bringer units within twelve inches of the general without spending a command point. That is the reason you take this host. Right. So, there. so, so we already know that when we are within seven inches of the feculent Narmor, uh, you get to run and charge. So, I'm now going to be able to guarantee a run roll of six at the cost of zero command points because my rot bringers are going to be able to do that. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Yeah. All that they'll be all be able to do it for for no command points because it's not a yeah. command ability. It's a command trait. Sweet. So, like, literally, you can yeah. be in command points for re-rolling hits and other cool things, uh, and right. everyone's running six. Uh, yeah, it's just once per turn, but that's the only catch to it. Um, you know, in a, in a very, very real way, this should, for a Nurgle army, just say, start the game with additional five command points. Because so that's how, like, it, so often you use your command points four at the double or a re-roll of a charge. Um, you know, in general, you're using them for movement um, because Nurgle's base movement is low. Mm. So you do everything you can to get those bonuses to get out there faster. And this is, this basically turns your Blight Kings into move 11. And I guess as well, it makes you think about the positioning of your army where your general is because you, you know, to, to be able to basically run for free for six, uh, they must be within 12 inches of the general. So uh, really thinking about where you put your general and then who you want to take advantage. And yes, anyone outside of 12 will then have to spend a command point if they want to run for six. Um, but the fact that, you know, yeah, the friendly rock bringers are going to be able to run for six for no command points within 12 of the general um, is pretty sweet. Yeah, and so a couple of just interesting notes on this. It only affects Rotbringer units, but it does not have to go onto a Rotbringer general. No. 
So it can go on a great unclean one. <laughs> Damn it. I was, I was about to make an Australian joke at you. I was going to say, are you thinking what I'm thinking, B1? Um, sorry, that's a bananas in pajamas if anyone watches Australian kids shows. Uh, <laughs> yes, I, that was the very first thing I was thinking about. I've never seen it done, but I was the very first thing I was thinking about was using the uh, the great unclean one. Its base is, what, 130, 160? Uh, I think it's a 100. Okay, uh, it's a it's a pretty gen generous base size, but yeah. that is a big radius of twelve inches from a big boy. Yes, it is. And if you're using the great unclean one with the bell, that gives you an extra three movement. Now you're hustling your unit an extra nine inches. Plus, you can get an extra two if you're on the right um, spot on the cycle of contagion. Um, your Nurgle units can get really really fast. No, that's sweet. So we got big benefit. Command yeah. points going to be safe for uh, combat, safe for other things. Uh, very, very cool. Speaking of command abilities, uh, you do get this command ability. So at the start of the comp, uh, sorry, you can use this command ability at the start of the combat phase. If you do so, pick one friendly uh, Blessed Sons Rockbringer unit, wholly within 14 of a Blessed Sons Rockbringer hero with this command ability. Then at the end of the phase, Pick one enemy enemy unit that suffers any wounds or mortal wounds inflicted by that unit in that phase. If the combined number of those wounds or mortal wounds is greater than the bravery characteristic of that enemy unit, the enemy unit suffers three additional mortal wounds. That's a mouthful. Basically, it's going to do mortal wounds. Um, yeah, it in the grand scheme of command abilities that Nurgle has access to, this one is really bad, and I have never used it. I'm looking at that going, eh, it sounds all right. It sounds, it's, it's okay. Maybe there's some secret tech there, but I'm, it's all right. I mean, the upshot is you're spending a command point to maybe deal three mortal wounds. It's not that good. <laughs> no, you're probably better off keeping those command points for your run rolls for your reroll ones to hit, um, yeah. something that will probably do more than uh, three mortal wounds. Yeah. Uh, and then the artifact you're going to get, so your first Blessed Sun hero uh, to receive the artifact will be given the Bloat Shield Bile Plate. Uh, you can reroll save rolls for attacks that target the bearer. Not bad. Uh, it, it, it can be really good because that, again, it doesn't. it's a Blessed Sun's hero. It is not Rotbringer. So you can put that on a great unclean one. You can put that on... Well played, uh, well played. I was thinking Rotbring. I'm like, okay, Lord of Afflictions, getting a reroll saves is all right. But yes, if you took the great unclean one and combine that with the uh, the additional 12-inch bubble that the, the command trait's going to give and then a reroll to save and then the additional way to heal that, um, you're going to heal D3 wounds a turn, uh, might get a little bit more consistency with the summoning from the, the cutting. Um, okay, okay. And if you're dipping into Slaves to Darkness, that goes really, really nice on a Chaos Lord on Carcadrag. Eh, very nice. Very nice. All right. Yeah. That's my, that, that, was my, that was my poor Borat. Whoa, whoa, whoa. All right. Let's talk about your first list. And uh, this is the Blessed Sons list that we were talking about. So Paul yes. is going to put this into practice. So this by no means is the one uh, list that's going to take you 5 and 0, oh, but it is a good example of of how we might put these rules into practice. You season for taste, depending on how you like your list. But Paul, uh, I'll read through the list and then you can take yep. me through why you've chosen what you've chosen. So your Grand Allegiance Nurgle, surprise of the century, you are coming from Gairan and we have taken the Blessed Sons uh, host of chaos. So what we've literally just talked about. What you have built in your list is a great unclean one, which is the general is command trait is Foul Conqueror, you've got the Bile Blade and the Doomsday Bell with the artifact, the Wither Stave. You've also got the Law of blah, 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 blah. You've got the Glorious Afflictions. Um, you've got the Law of, uh, so you've got a Lord of Blights uh, with the artifact of the Bloat, Bloat Shell Bile Plate, which is the artifact that we've got to take for the Blessed Sons. You've got Gut Rot Spume. You've also got, um, was it Festus, the Leech Lord, who's got Blades of Putrefaction. In your list, you also have 10 Black Kings, 10 Black Kings, 10 Black Kings, 5 Black Kings, 5 Black Kings. They all wrapped up in a nice little bow of the Blight Cyst coming in at 2K on the dot, and 
Again, I'll do my best bore out. Whoa, 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 whoa. 196 wounds. Talk me through this list. So we talked already about the Great Unclean one. So Great Unclean one is giving us this massive area of uh, running at six for free. We've talked about some of the, the benefits to casting. It's a super durable hero. What else does a Great Unclean one bring to the table? Um, so this one in particular, this is your utility build, Great Unclean one. So he's making everybody within seven inches of him. Uh, move an extra three inches, and he can give himself plus one to cast. Uh, that plus one to cast is really important to control the cycle of contagion. Um, the artifact I gave him, the Wither Stave, that makes your opponent re-roll all hit rolls of six within 12 inches of him. Um, again, big base. He, His uh, Doomsday Bell plus three movement affects himself, so he's moving eight inches. Um, so he really gets up in there and, uh, if you think a lot of things trigger on a six to wound, a lot more trigger on six to hit. There's a lot of like mortal wounds on sixes that stop the, the cycle. There's exploding sixes. So sixes become two or three hits. Um, that's, that's pretty good. Yep. And then, uh, the spell that I gave him, uh, glorious afflictions, it has a 21 inch range and goes off on a six. And the unit that it affects is half move. Oh, five? It goes off on a five. Glorious affliction cast value of five. So um, even better. Even better. It is outrageously good at casting value of five because it will half movement, run, and charge for the unit that it affects. That is 21 inches away. It's a pain in the ass. It's a pain in the ass. And then if you see yourself next to, uh, is it overgrown that, uh, or is it uh, entang entangling? Uh, should there be an entangling terrain piece as well? Uh, my gosh, it is. Uh, I mean, games are going to win or lose by movement, right? Being able to not get to an objective or forcing someone to spend a command point to run when they really wanted to charge or just get up the board. Um, right. That is a good spell. And it's five. That's five. Uh, it's yeah it's it you know i was running a different spell on him for a long time and then i like reread the book and i'm like why am i not using glorious afflictions this is so good um i do i often do see the the great unclean one as well with the flavored poxes which is the casting value of seven and then uh the unit within 14 subtracts one to hit rolls wound rolls and save rolls which yeah. Uh, is a pain in the butt as well, especially because um, uh, until the caster moves, or, you know, for, for something like, yeah, it, it can be a pain in the butt. But I yeah. like this Glorious Afflictions. It's a, it's a good spell. Yep. Um, and it, it's doing a thing that you let Nurgle wants to do is be faster than your opponent, slow your opponent down, grind them out. It really is effective at that. Uh, Lord of Blights, he's basically just attacks in the battalion, and um, I had a second artifact, um, and the mandatory artifact to take for the battalion, and two other heroes that are unique, so I can't give them artifacts, so he got the Bloodshell Bioplate. It is what it is. Um, <laughs> Uh, Gut Rot Spume, he lets you uh, take a unit of Blight Kings and he deploys with them off the board. And during your first movement phase, they come on any board edge within six inches of the board edge, more than nine inches away from enemy models with that unit of Blight Kings. So that is you know, one of the little alpha strike sort of tricks that Nurgle can pull. Uh, Blight Kings with their musician get plus one to run in charge. So they are on uh, an eight inch or an eight to roll to charge um, off of their drop. And uh, they're with a hero coming in so they can spend a command point to re-roll that charge. So it's really powerful that charge lands an awful lot. I can honestly say I've never played against Gut Rot Spume. I actually don't even know what the model looks like. 
I've never seen it, but that is such a good little ability to be able to um, place him and up to one unit of Black Kings um, in like a deep strike um, within six inches of each other, uh, six inches of a, uh, a table edge, more than nine from an enemy. So um, yeah, that's pretty and, good. And 10 units uh, or 10 models of Black Kings uh, suddenly in your backfield is a massive distraction. What's the base size of a Black King? 40s? Yeah, they're 40s. Okay. So it's still quite generous. Like you've got six inches um, outside of nine. Um, you keep them in reserve. Um, so you don't deploy uh, and you bring them in on the first movement phase. So so what you'll find, so I, I used to play Legion of Night, um, who have a very similar rule to this. And I always find that my opponents will always deploy differently. They will stretch themselves as far as they can to deny you that six inches and stop you coming in from the backfield. Um, but what you often then find is your opponents probably stretch themselves out of buff ranges. You can then, with your speed, probably stretch them a little bit, being able to you know tag certain units or get into combats and really force that that decision making process because they don't have this castle or center of power or they don't have enough heroes to be able to handle you from the side. So, you know, you, I always find it used to psychologically get a get an up on your opponent before they've even rolled the dice. Yes. The it, gut rot spume I think is even more valuable for what it does to your opponent psychologically than um his actual power on the board and his power on the board with a unit of 10 blight kings is really good to begin with so it it's really it's spreading your opponent thin it's making them distracted they're pulling uh valuable offensive units away from objectives and if and you're a jerk like me uh i used to be able to I, like the last in my legion of night list the last thing i would deploy is my terror geist and i could always deep strike with my terror geist it was i, I could in legion of night and I would always make it, and people are always scared of a deep striking terror geist, but I never did it. I never did it. Just because I can doesn't mean I do it. Um, and yep. you will find your opponent will deploy very differently. And then you can choose to go, right, well, if I have to bring on Gut Rot Spume in the first turn, depending on if they've given me the space to do what I want to do, or I don't feel comfortable because I'm just going to have to come on the side of the board and... Um, I'm not going to really take the advantage. I don't have to. So just because you can doesn't mean you should. Right. Exactly. And there's been plenty of times where I've just dropped them in my own backfield. I'm just like, haha, I, I don't have to worry about this right now. These are going to be part of my main force. And, you know, well, uh, I, I just got you to deploy wrong. And yeah, that's yeah. All need to do. Yep, and then you use a slingshot to punish them. So I like that. That's, that's cool. I haven't seen Gut Rot Spume before, but I think if you're a Nurgle player, uh, with the benefits of the Blight Kings going down in General's Handbook 2020, I think this is a very good... Uh, and, and you know what? KO, for example, this will give you a nice little thing to kind of hide uh, certain models off the board. So, yeah, uh, I like it. Or maybe yep. even go for, like, the uh, the Lord Croak from in the backfield who's kind of being a nightmare... You know, you, you've got something to kind of threaten those types of, you know, lots of change at the back of the fat table. Yep. I like it. I like it. So next we have Festus the Leech Lord. He is your Rotbringer Wizard um, for, well, there's also a Rotbringer Sorcerer, but he's a, your named Rotbringer Wizard. Um, I gave him the Blades of Putrefaction, which um, it targets a unit within 14 inches and until your next hero phase, all of their six plus to hit do a mortal wound in addition to normal damage, um, which is really strong. Uh, you know, five Blight Kings throw 15 attacks. So that's going to average out to at least two mortal wounds uh, on you know, one round of attacks from a unit of five Blight Kings. Um, his signature yeah. spell is quite. I'm just reading the signature spell right now. The Curse of the yes. Leper. That that whenever I've seen Festus on the table, it's always casting his signature spell because it goes off on a seven, 14 inch range. But the benefits is you subtract one to the save roll to the unit for the rest of the game. Like that's crazy. Yeah. 
Like it's not just per round. It's not a phase. Literally, you are minus one to your armor save for the entire game. Uh, and there's no way to remove that. So um, anything that's got a really high armor save, um, you're able to bring that down quite quite significantly. Yeah. It, and in combination then with what Blight Sis does, Blight Sis gives all of your Blight Kings rent one. And in addition, it also makes all of them uh, ignore enemy cover. So that is a major hit to your opponent's defenses. You you can use Festus to wither away their armor for one, and then the Rend takes another one off of them. Um, an interesting note for folks out there, uh, Blight Cyst is kind of randomly good against... Um, oh, I, I didn't have Deepkin. They're... I believe it's low tide that they're that they get the save bonus. That save is worded as cover. Yes, it's treated as treated as being in cover for the first turn. Yes, and blight cyst makes all of your blight kings ignore enemy cover. Okay, okay. I'd have to look at the rule interaction. That's an interesting one. Um, yep. I'm just I'm just looking at blight cyst as well. So that means your army is four drops, right? Because yeah. your lord of blights, the all of the blight kings. Um, you can take a sorcerer and you can take a harbor harbinger of decay, but you don't have to. They're zero to ones. Yep. So that means that your Blight Kings, your Lord of Blights, uh, is one drop, and then Festus Gut Rot and uh, Lord of uh, Great Unclean One. So you're four drop. Yep. Exactly. Um, and then the Putrid Blight Kings, you know, they are the Nurgle staple. They uh, throw three attacks each on threes and threes. The Blight Sis gives them rend one, they're one damage, but all of their sixes to hit turn into D6 hits. And that was recently changed, right? Because it used to be... Right. It used uh, to be plus. Yes, yeah, so it used to be six plus, because I remember playing against a whole bunch of Nurgle players with my Grots, and my Grots do minus one to hit uh, with their netters, and that would stop them from doing the exploding sixes because uh, it obviously made it... Uh, un unattainable but now that it's an unmodified six the net will still cause minus one but you'll still get your explosion yes and important for our next list blades of putrefaction did not get that faq so if you get plus one to hit then you're doing it on fives so but blight kings in general they're a unit of five is 21 wounds on a four up save. I mean, they are just a brick. You're putting a ton of wounds on the table, um, a decent number of bodies on the table. This is 40 blight Kings in this list. Um, plus you have your great unclean one that is just, you know, very difficult to kill and also becomes like this distraction carnifax a lot of the time that your opponent just thinks that they need to take down the big guy and they go after him. And after the first couple of turns, he's not as useful anymore. Um, so it's, it, it can be a good late game distraction. The black Kings heal themselves through the discharge, right? That in your hero phase, you roll a dice for each unit, friend or foe within three on a six, they suffer D D three mortal wounds, but if they've got the Nurgle keyword, they heal D3. Yes. So that means if, you, if you've got two units of Black Kings next to each other and you roll the six, they can heal D3 wounds. In addition to other ways, you could heal like the um, the Contagion Wheel. Right. And the spell, the, uh, the signature spell on the Great Unclean one can heal as well. Yeah, nice. Yeah. And you know, it's four, four wounds, so all it takes is keeping a, a Black King on one wound, and you can bring that body up to full, So, uh, which is really where it becomes really tough. And the Blight Lord, so the unit champion, has five wounds instead of four. So I've seen some very tactical play where, where uh, my opponent has taken out the Blight Lord to stop the attrition in the, the Black King. So um, I like it. I like it. And you get a cool little buff to your bravery through the Icon Bearer, um, yeah. You get the the run and charge rolls when you've got your little musician. Yeah, yeah. So your blight kings can get really, really fast. Um, if I was going to a tournament right now, it, I would probably run a list that looked something like this. 
talk to me about why you've taken the way you've taken them. Like, why didn't you roll up the the five, the two units of five into a unit of ten, or why didn't you make the unit of ten um, uh, much more? Like, you can take a unit up to twenty, right, and you get massive regiment discounts. So, uh, why did you do the what you did? Um, I find that when they're in units of more than ten, it's hard to get all of the bodies into combat, um, even at a unit of 10 with 40 millimeter bases, it's hard to get all of the models into combat. So then you're just kind of wasting attacks. I see people run, you know, the massive regiment of 20. And I just think to myself, unless your opponent is intentionally getting into multiple combats with that one unit, you're wasting so much power. Like, yes, you're getting a points discount, but at what cost? Um, the fives I like to use, um, you know, to grab objectives, to hold objectives. Um, they're kind of, they can be kind of used as chaff sometimes. Um, the units of 10 are really more of like the hammery kind of unit. Um, and the units of five are more uh, mobile little pieces to, uh, you know, block the way. They can be chaff, they can be objective holders, they can, you know, take on some small things. And it's 20, 21 wounds as well. Like that's, yeah. while it's only five models, 21 wounds at a four plus armor save is no joke. Right. Exactly. It, they, they do work. They average, they're going to average making your opponent roll uh, 10 saves for every five. Do you see, uh, before we move to the other list, um, now, I know that you've got the Harbringer of Decay and the Sorcerer can be a part of the battalion. Do you yep. think that's worthwhile including, or do you see a world where maybe you would include those to maybe lower your drops? Uh, absolutely. I would definitely do that. Um, I would definitely consider a one-drop Blight Sys list. Um, I don't see any problem with doing that. You, know, you would get Lord of Blights, Harbinger of Decay, and a Sorcerer. So you have three heroes, which is a good base for all of your buffs. Um, and then fill up the rest with Blight Kings and Endless Spells. And I think it would be, I think that would be solid. And you'd be a one drop, which is, you know, it, very valuable. Before I go, you, you, you've raised one thing. I, I was about to move and then you said something and I'll, I, I can't move off it. Um, you said Endless Spells. Is there any Endless Spells that would maybe work well with this type of list um, or maybe ones that if, if you had some points spare uh, maybe you want to drop a unit, another unit of 10 to five or drop one of those five altogether. Is there any endless spells that maybe you'd bring into the, into this list? Um, I like the soul snare shackles a lot. Um, they, As a Gargan player, I don't like them. Just, just FYI. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They are, um, they're really useful, especially stacking with Glorious Afflictions, um, either spreading out more units that are half movement or uh, getting one unit down to a quarter movement. Um, so that one's really strong. Um, Do you think Geminids, uh, like, you know, minus one to yep. hit, minus one attack? Yep, Geminids are another really good option um, to debuff your opponent's offense. I actually like the Aether Void Pendulum in uh, Nurgle lists. Uh, you tend to not have a lot of um, power projection with Nurgle. Like you're, you're very much like you can get your stuff across the board, and that's fine. But if you have a hero hiding behind a line, there it's challenging to get to them. And the Pendulum gives you an option to. You just shoot it and it, goes, it just goes forward, right? It either gets dispelled or it just goes forward. So you don't have to worry about uh, Gemini's coming back at you, at least with the, the the pendulum. It just goes straight forward and it kind of follows the path that uh, your Black Kings were going to go anyway. Yep. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. Uh, but Soul Snare Shackles are my most common one to take. Um, there's a, just a sort of a, a quick side note. There's, between artifacts and command traits and spells and things that are like signature spells and abilities on your units, there's kind of like different paths of debuffing your opponent that you can take. 
Um, this particular list kind of did like a smattering a little bit of everything. Um, but you could go a list that goes hard into reducing your opponent's armor. Mm. You can go down a list that is hard into uh, debuffing hit and wound um, yeah. or debuffing movement. So there's different options in there. Seasons for season for taste, you know, like yeah, you can yep. you can really double down on the to hit rolls, for example, like having big blocks of your uh plague bearers at minus two to hit in combat, minus one in, in shooting, and until it degrades. Uh there's a lot of different ways I guess you can build around this. But I think again, this kind of goes back to the toolbox you were mentioning earlier. But this was a cool list. I like it. Again, season for taste, people might want to tweak around, modify it, but I think we've put in a good example of how the blessed sons comes into play. Now, Paul sent me this other quirky list. Now, I know he put me to work. When I looked at this, I'm like, what on earth is this point voice smoking? Is it legal where he lives? We are looking at Allegiance Nurgle. It is still from Gairan. And what have we got here? So this is all basically Slaves to Darkness. So, Paul, you're yeah. going to take us away in a minute, but you have the Chaos Sorcerer Lord with the uh, Plague Squall. We have a Sorcerer with the Muttergrub and the Blades of Putrefaction. We have the Chaos Lord on Demonic Mount, which is the General with Grand Flood's Blessing and the Wither Stave. Again, we've seen some commonality here. The Wither Stave is here to stay. We've got 20 Chaos Warriors with the Hand Weapon Shield, a 20, sorry, 10 Chaos Knights with their Ensorcelled Weapons, 20 Chaos Marauders with their Flails, 20 Chaos Marauders with their Flails, five Chaos Marauder Horsemen, five Chaos Marauder Horsemen, all with Shield and Axes. Under the, so with the Chaos War Shrine with the Plague Touch Warband, uh, uh, it was nice to see 2018 call. I haven't seen Plague Touch for a while. Um, <laughs> so I picked up the phone, like, hello. It's like, oh, it's 2018. It's me. It's Plague Touched. What's going on? Yeah. Um, so, so talk me to, to this. This is not quite the book. Mag uh, this is not Maggot Kin of Nurgle. These yeah, are all coming from. Uh, apart from the one sorcerer, that is the one thing that is um, from Maggot Kin of Nurgle. And compared to uh, the previous list, uh, we're only sharing uh, Blades of Putrefaction and the Wither Stave. Those are the only two things that are the same between the two lists. So this is the example that Paul was talking earlier about, guys, about marking your chaos. So being able to pull from Slave to Darkness, being able to pull from Beast of Chaos, being able to pull from Skaven. Uh, you can see here that this, this is still combining some of the best of what we just spoke about in the past, but has now brought in a different flavor. So talk to me about how this list is different to the Black King list, and then let's maybe break down uh, what is going on here. Yeah. So uh, just a quick note first, the Chaos Marauders, um, I made an error when I sent this over to you. They should be uh, Axe and Shield, not uh, Flails. Cool. Um, Is, was, that, was that a formatting error or was that just a decision that you forgot to, you know, flick, flick on the scroll build on? I forgot to check the box, basically. <laughs> why, why not Flails then? Uh, they do less attacks, less damage. Um, you get a greater quantity of attacks in with the Axes. Um, which is important for combining with Blades of Putrefaction. Cool. Just, just for anyone who's thinking, like, why, why is that important? Uh, good to call out. So maybe let's start with the general first. Let's start with the Chaos Lord on Demonic Mount with the Grand Flood's Blessing Command Trait and the Wither Stave. Right. So his command ability lets you take a unit of Chaos Knights or Chaos Chariots. They get... Um, Plus one to hit until the next battle, uh, until your next hero phase, and they also reroll charges. So it really makes you want to take a unit of chaos knights like these ten that I have here and just fling them across the board at your opponent. Um, that plus one to hit uh, synergizes nicely with uh, blades of putrefaction that's on our sorcerer. So our Blades of Putrefaction is on a six plus that it does a mortal wound in addition to uh, normal damage. So with the command ability on the Chaos Lord on Demonic Mount, your Chaos Knights, your unit of 10 Chaos Knights is throwing 50 attacks that do mortal wounds on hits of five. 
Um, and then similarly for your Chaos Marauders, when there's 10 or more models left in the unit, they get plus one to hit. So they are also Blades of, Petrifa Blades of Petrifaction bombs as well as just being an all-around good unit on their own. Same thing with the Chaos Knights. They're good, and then you buff them up more. And that is uh, just sort of the general concept of this army. And uh, the Wither Stave is just a good defensive uh, artifact. It makes your opponent reroll hit rolls of six. So they're, you know, it's basically, it mathematically, thinking about it, it's the inverse of reroll ones to hit. I like it. The rune shield that he's got uh, gives him a five up mortal wound save. The right. weapon uh, does mortal two mortal wounds on an attack roll of a six, which is which is cool. The the attack sequence does end, but uh, some cheeky mortal wounds from that attack of a six. Yes. Um, you at the end of the combat phase, uh, if you've slain um, a model with the the warhammer, uh, you also can heal D three mortal wounds. So he, he it does have eight wounds. So being able to heal D3 as well uh, just makes it really survival when you consider the 4-plus armor save, the 5-plus mortal wound save, um, and then heals. That's a super tanky uh, little general you got there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so our sorcerer, he's really here for Blades of Putrefaction. Uh, the Mutter Grub artifact that allows him to cast an additional spell each turn. So that's going to give him... Uh, more flexibility to uh, cast the spell that moves uh, the cycle of contagion. Um, your chaos sorcerer lord, um, his signature spell is really good on its own, being able to reroll uh, hits and wounds. Um, Plague Squall is another one of those spells where you can do uh, mortal wounds to your opponent. Um, without any range restriction. It's just a uh, uh, line of sight. So you roll seven dice and for each six that are it, that's rolled on those seven dice, you can do D3 mortal wounds to a visible enemy unit. I like it. I like it. Um, any reason why you didn't take the Chaos Sorcerer Lord on Manticore? Cause that seems to be quite a popular sorcerer. Um, I didn't, yeah, but I was going to make a joke that might make me sound like an idiot. I was just <laughs> going to say, I didn't know they couldn't uh, come not on the manticore, but then clearly um, it's right here. But yeah. <laughs> why, why, why not the manticore? Like what was in the decision-making process not to go with the manticore, but rather one um, unmounted? Um, really tight on points. I was going to ask you, is that, it just that's points? Really, it, that's really the answer. That's why the Chaos Lord on Demonic Mount is not a Chaos Lord on Karkadrak. I just don't have the points for it. It's not worth dropping, let's say, five of your Marauder Horsemen to, to get those extra points? Well, and then you end up with a weird number of points, and what do you do with them? And then you've also got to math in having the eight units for the um, Plague Touch Warband. And so for those that are not familiar with the current version of the Plague Touch Warband. What it does is you take one uh, Nurgle Slaves to Darkness hero and seven Nurgle Slaves to Darkness units. And whenever your opponent uh, rolls a wound roll of a six against them, they take a mortal wound. So they are just bouncing back mortal wounds all day long. Um, it is, it's really good. It's really punishing. Um, there is a second ability on there as well that I'm not remembering. At the uh, in addition to your hero phase, you can pick one unit from this battalion and one enemy unit within an inch of it. Uh, if you do so, roll a dice on a three plus, the enemy takes uh, D3 mortal wounds. So just shoving more mortal wounds at your opponent if you're uh, locked in combat. Yeah. Um, so the big things that this list is really looking to do, your uh, Chaos Warriors are a big defensive anvil block. They're, when there's more than 10 of them, they re-roll their saves. The, you can use the Chaos War Shrines prayers to get them to a three-up save. So they're three-up re-rolling um, on defense and 
you know, 20 of them is a block of 40 wounds. So it's going to be really difficult to shift that off an objective. Your chaos knights are a really strong, fast offensive block. Um, they can also, they're 10 bodies, so they're good at holding objectives and they're large bases. So you can spread them out and really like wall off an area very effectively with them. And also, you know, with the war shrine, you can give them a plus one to save with the war shrine as well, um, as well as getting reroll saves from the chaos sorcerer lord. Yeah. Well, they already reroll saves for having 10 or more models with the shield. No, the shield is five up mortal wound save. Oh, sorry. The, sorry. The legions of chaos. Sorry. You can reroll save rolls for attacks while they've got 10, or, 10 models. Yes. There's a lot of ways for on a four plus save, you're able to, uh, oh, yeah. And then the five up uh, chaos rune shields. Yep. Um, any reason why you didn't go the halberds or the great blades? Is it the fact that you can reroll hit rolls? Oh, no, it's with, it's with a pair of hand weapons. Sorry. Why, why the hand weapons and shield? Um, I think they are, I think they're just, on average, kind of like the best option. The the Halberds really are, they're probably better um, in a lot of situations, but only when you have a really big block. Once you start getting whittled down, then it's better to just have the hand weapon shield. So I think, and you're not having the great weapon, then you lose the shield. And that's because the halberd has a two-inch range, guys, is what Paul's talking about. So if you've got a large unit, uh, if you get a unit of 20, for example, it's very unlikely that all 20 would be in combat. So by having the the two-inch range, because they're on a 32 more base, right? Yeah. Yeah, so having a two-inch range in, um, would allow you to get more attacks in, um, but you would then sacrifice having the rune shield, right? Oh, no, 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 you get cast halberd and rune shield. So you still get the rune shield with the halberd. You just... Uh, you could uh, you, you don't get the shield if you take the great blade or the hand or or the double hand weapons. Yep, you're hitting with your hit and wound roll is just worse with yeah, uh, okay. the halberd. Um, chaos marauders. I mean, they're probably one of the most efficient units in the game right now. Um, you don't want to leave home without them. Um, I and what makes and what makes it for them? Like, because I imagine there are some people that maybe don't own Marauders. They've heard the internet talking about Marauders. Um, but what, from your opinion, makes Marauders just a really good unit to take? Um, they are inexpensive for you know their number of wounds to uh, points. Um, you're getting twenty models for 160 points. Um, they're doing two attacks each. Um, they're plus one to hit if there's 10 or more models. They get rend one if there's 20 or more models. So they're they're definitely punchy. I think that for axes and shields, I think that puts them on threes and fours, uh, rend one most of the time. Um, and then your Chaos War Shrine can give them plus one to save and uh, get them up to a four up save. The Chaos Sorcerer Lord can give them save rerolls and reroll hits and wounds with his spell. So there's there's just all of your different buff pieces in the army synergize really, really well with the Chaos Marauders. And it's probably worth calling out as well, probably the, the thing that people really like that we didn't touch on just yet, which was the Boundless um, Ferocity, which is uh, with Marauders when you charge, uh, when you make a charge roll, you get to change the lowest dice roll to a six. And if you roll a double, you still get to change one to a six. So it, it means you're guaranteed charge seven at bare minimum. Um, very That's likely. Because their musician gives them plus one. And then you add the musician if, if you should have it, because you get to add plus one to run and charge rolls for the drummer. Um, so a guaranteed eight uh, is no laughing matter, let alone should you happen to roll a four as well. You know, you start going tens and twelves. Um, you've truly guaranteed yourself a charge. Uh, if you bring them in from the side from some way or uh, you go for a long charge, that's pretty attractive. And... They yep. can be marked corn, zench, nurgle, or slanesh, so uh, they can get some of those nurgly benefits too. Yeah, and, and the big one here is for both the chaos knights and the chaos marauders in particular. You have the feculent gnarl maw that's letting them run in charge, which is something that you can't do in it with any of the other chaos gods. 
that's um, a really, really valuable, important thing. It, it lets you alpha strike with Chaos Knights, alpha strike with your Chaos Marauders. Uh, then I threw in the Marauder Horsemen. Um, I really like them in general. I feel like they're undervalued and not talked about. They're their 12 inch move they are two wounds each five up save they're quick they're a great screen or chaff they're great at grabbing objectives they're um a good disruptor in general uh i feel like they're just very valuable pieces if you're building an army that is diverse and well-rounded you know if you want to you know, not risk that alpha strike. You move the Chaos Marauder Horseman out in front of your Chaos Knights to screen them off so you can set up your charge on the next turn. You know, you they give you a lot of good options. And having stuff that moves 12 inches is just always really powerful. They act very similar to my Pistoliers. I actually got to play, um, I, I played it in a, literally the last tournament in Australia before COVID hit. Uh, I got to play a Doom and Darkness. He he um, he had an event. He ran an event with uh, with Matt the Wildform Weiss. And my second opponent uh, was actually a, a Slaves to Darkness opponent, which was all basically Chaos Knights with the Lord on Kakadrak. But he also did have two units of these Chaos Marauder Horsemen, and they were pure MVPs because uh, one of the cool rules that um, I really like from this is that they can retreat and shoot or charge in the same turn. So should they get pinned? Um, should they uh, get into combat? And then, you know, you can retreat from combat and then kind of wrap around your opponent to get to its nice, juicy little center. Um, that's pretty sweet, right? Or you can use that to slingshot yourself into a backfield objective uh, by being able to retreat. So, um, and, and again, the Feculent Gnarl Maw comes into play because now you can do a run in your retreat move and then still charge. And if people ignore those Chaos Marauder Horsemen, they're going to make you punish. If they then focus or target onto those Chaos Marauder Horsemen, cool, that's damage that's not going into your, your regular Marauders or your Chaos Knights or your Chaos Warriors or you know your other things. So it's it's just win-win both cases. I really like them. They um, Again, they, they're very similar to my Pistoles and Cities of Sigma. Um, even at a unit of five, they, they add incredible value. Yes, absolutely. And they're very efficiently costed, you know? They're, they're very cheap. They're very cheap. Um, the fact they got a shooting attack, the fact that they move 12, the fact that they can be God marked, um, the fact that they can retreat and shoot or retreat and charge, um, it's great value for 110 points. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and then we have, uh, don't, don't leave home without it, the Chaos War Shrine. Yes. So when you're marked Nurgle, the uh, the buffed up Chaos War Shrine ability is plus one to save. Um, that doesn't come up a lot in Age of Sigmar anymore. <laughs> plus one to save. So, no. no. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's just not very common at all to see that ability. Uh, and the regular level of the prayer is plus one to wound. So you're getting more offensive power and more defensive power. Um, it synergizes with literally every other model in the list. Because of its um, keyword Nurgle. So you right. do have to choose uh, the keyword. It can be undivided. It can be any of the gods. Uh, so just just a clarity, Paul, the whole army doesn't get plus one towards armor save. It's actually based on this protection of the dark gods, right? Where right. Uh, when it's unwounded, it's going to be everything Nurgle within 18. But then as it takes damage, it goes down to 12, 9, 6, 3. Is that right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a prayer that it affects one unit. Um, but I believe it's within 18 inches. And um, it goes off on a, th a prayer on a three. Uh, yeah. So you have a two thirds chance of getting that to go off. So in general, it's gonna be pretty consistent. It's very strong. Um, the war shrine is also giving you uh, a six up uh, ward save within 18 inches of it, which is another really uh, nice little added buff um, with the New GHB getting rid of the ward safe stacking, it becomes a little bit of a non bow with your chaos, chaos warriors. Yeah, 
Yeah, so it's not like you yeah. can't go. You can't go uh, the five up rune shield and then a six plus from the war shrine. Because I remember used to when I played the when I used to play old plague the plague touched. I remember playing against you know cow knights with the shields right. So you had like the four up armor save or the three up armor save. Then it was like uh, a five up wound or mortal wound save. Then it was the additional war shrine saves. It was just super tough, super durable. But now you have to choose whether I take the five up. Uh, if if I have multiple uh, mortal wound saves, uh, it's either I I still take my armor save, my four plus five plus armor save. But then I have to choose one of those damage prevention rolls, whether it's the five up from the rune shield or the six up from the war shrine. Which clearly, obviously, which one you take. But you do need to make a choice. Right. That is, yeah. And there's just a lot of tricks and a lot of synergy. The the key with running um, slaves to darkness units in a Nurgle list is really that they have so many synergies, so many buffs across the army, uh, different things interacting with each other that just can make your units really, really potent. Um, and I think with some of them, clearly it, it wasn't um, really planned that way, right? Like Blades of Putrefaction going off on a six plus instead of an unmodified six completely changes the nature of running Chaos Knights and Marauders in a Nurgle list, you know, <laughs> and in a way that it, you know, you don't have that come up in with the other uh, three Chaos Gods or with the Slaves to Darkness list. And who knows what's going to come in with uh, Broken Realms. You know, only imagine that there will be some version of Nurgle. It might be Sylvaneth versus Nurgle and what that story progressing looks like and what that brings to the table. But I think for me, uh, we've kind of seen a nice little evolution through your lists, you know, based on the General's Handbook updates to Black Kings. Again, they got a nice little points reduction, which means you get more for less. Um, you've had some war scroll changes. So we talked about the Black Kings exploding on sixes that went from a, a six plus to a flat six, which uh, does change the game, especially with a lot of modifiers running around at the moment. We then had Wrath of the Everchosen when they brought in a whole bunch of additional rules. We saw the, the, the Blessed Sons, but there's also like the Drowned Men. There are other, other different sub-allegiances you can draw from the yeah. Wrath of the Everchosen. And then we had Slaves to Darkness added this year as well. So all of a sudden, the tools in your toolkit um, have exploded. Uh, I will say that you probably lost a little bit from the nerfing in Skaven. Um, you used to see a lot more of the like the Plague Monks and the Sensor Bearers and the Plague kind of stuff from, from Skaven, but they have had uh, some adjustments, so you probably don't see them as much as you, as you used to. But so, and also the Plague Monks before, for the Skaven Battle Tome, they would uh, get like plus one to hit, plus one to wound for like massive regiment bonus. Um, and that got moved to an allegiance ability in the Skaven book. So it's not on the War Scroll. Mm. Uh, but that made them also a great Blades of Putrefaction target previously. They're still a great target because they're throwing a lot of attacks. <laughs> They're still good, but they're just not nearly like they used to be. There used to be a point where they were auto include. You know, at minimum, it was one yeah. block of forty plague monks. I played Nurgle list that had a hundred and hundred and twenty plague monks, um, which is just a nightmare for anyone who doesn't have shooting. It's just like game over um, because it's just going to kill you on the way out. But um, I think the point, you know, the point hopefully of this episode is you should feel empowered that Nurgle does have a whole bunch of new tools to um to be able to play with now and as the meta has evolved you know since we've kind of had tournaments kind of playing out you know we've had lumineth realm lords so the fact that you don't have to rely on a lot of magic i know there's some cool magic that you've got but the fact that you're not reliant on it uh kind of means that you just get to play your game game plan against no uh against lumineth um some of the things, you know, like maybe you know seraphon again you can kind of ignore law croak but uh, they do have a lot of rend um I think I, I think you've got some good tools. I think Nurgle players should feel excited that um, they have a new toolbox and they can play around with some cool lists. And who knows, we may see a day where the Thricefall Battalion or the old, you know, the demons come back uh, in, in force. I think Pusk or Bite Lords, uh, we haven't really seen their day in the sun just yet. They're real good. Uh, I have run them. If you take them in a unit of four with a Lord of Afflictions, they are really, really good. 
I've only played a couple of them, um, and, and they are tough as nails, and they've got a lot of speed, which is great. But I don't think we've kind of seen their day in the sun just yet. Last question I've got for you, Paul, before we kind of wrap this up, and this has been awesome. I, I really appreciate your time here. Yeah. What have you learned over the, all the time that you've played with Nurgle and list theoring and putting on the table? Like, what have you learned that might not be as obvious when you very first pick up this book? Is there anything, in, in, uh, whether it's from Playstyle, whether it's uh, maybe it's the wheel, maybe it's about your feculate norm, or is it just maybe some concepts you now bring to your list building that weren't there at the start? Um, you know, that's a really good question. Um, I think managing the cycle of contagion is very important. Um, understanding the different things that you can do with moving that around, uh, both with, uh, your command trait and the spells that are available. Um, you know, one of the things with Nurgle is that it's been constantly evolving because it dips into so many different things. Um, you know, so many other books that it kind of borrows pieces from. And what I've really learned, I think, is to never assume that I understand it. To really always go back, reread an artifact, reread a war scroll, um, because you just miss stuff. It it's an army that has that all of your units have a lot of abilities, and it's easy to miss things. And um, you know, it, it there's hidden gems in the book that you didn't realize were there. And I, I think you know that as the meta shifts, uh, the questions that our games are asking uh, become different. So uh, yep. you know, pre pre Carriage and Overlords. You know, you know, bringing back the shooting meta, and city, even cities of Sigma to a degree, they were kind of bringing back the shooting meta. Um, you didn't have to worry about shooting as much, right? So different questions were being asked at the table. Now, now that there are different questions, whether it's the magic, whether it's the shooting, um, you now have different answers from different questions. So I think, as you've mentioned, you know, having fresh eyes, and yeah, you know what. Um, Chaos spawns or uh, you know, nurglings, for example, have never been good. But actually, maybe now is the right time to bring in nurglings. Maybe nurglings offer something that you haven't thought about because, and by revisiting or looking at some synergies or looking at, oh, actually, there's some really cheap things that, you know, now that there's eight, uh, sorry, there's a scenario with maybe eight objectives that uh, we previously haven't had in the past. Well, this might be a way for me to handle that scenario. You know what I mean? Like, that's good. That's really good advice. I think for me, I want to kind of bring back a point that you made right at the start, and that is thinking about your contagion points and thinking about don't save it up for a big spend at the end. I think that's a trap. Um, don't 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 have your eyes fixated on, oh, how great it would be if I bring a great unclean one on the table. Uh, I think you just get laser focus and you miss really good opportunities. So for me, if I was in your shoes, I'd be thinking about five and ten people uh, uh plague bearers uh with the exception as you mentioned as well with some of these you know hero scenarios where um uh, uh, having a leader within six gets you a bonus points maybe it is time to bring in sloppity bar pipe and bring in one of the other minor heroes for 14 points so um, the wizard, which is not nothing that's nothing nothing to sneeze at yeah so I think that's a good shout because if we if we recorded this six months ago, we would we probably would have not. I, I, actually, I think the last faction focus. I don't think we even talked about those characters. But now it's it's actually worth considering. Yeah. Um. And, you know, I think the note that I would want to leave off on in terms of strategy, playing Nurgle, and um just sort of how how the army has evolved over time. If you look at the lore, the fluff of Nurgle, one of the characteristics of Nurgle as an individual, as the god, is that Nurgle is very patient. And I think you need to be very patient playing this army. I'm going to end it at that. I don't think I could uh, end it any better. Paul, 
if people want to talk list with you, if they want to uh, learn more about the army or the the way you think or you know bounce ideas with you, um, I'm going to have your Twitter handle below. But you know, where can people chat to you? Where can people find out more from you? Um, my channel on YouTube is Radio Free Hammer Hall. Um, you can find me uh, at PMC Math Hammer on Twitter. Uh, you can feel free to look me up on Facebook. I'm happy to friend uh fans um you know um i tend paul to is the meme lord by the way he is yeah. an absolute meme you like memes paul is the man you want to follow uh he does does get banned by facebook every every month at least i think it's a reoccurring thing but you have some cracking memes yeah uh, i dodged a 30 day recently uh, I, I think it was an error I, like I was, it was telling me that there were certain things that I couldn't do for 30 days and then it, it went away. So I, I feel like I dodged a bullet. So if Paul doesn't answer you immediately, he's probably been zucked. <laughs> yeah. Well, Messenger, when you get banned for 30 days from Facebook, Messenger still works. I have noticed that we, we, we still do chat on Messenger. Cool. So Twitter handle is below. Uh, go check out Radio Free Hammer Hall. It is a wonderful channel. Highly recommend it. Paul does talk not only Nurgle, but he does talk Maths Hammer, something that he's very passionate about. We actually did an episode uh, a couple of months ago where we did talk about Maths Hammer and understanding statistics, you know, understanding the likelihood of a, of a nine inch charge, understanding the likelihood of a two plus, three plus, four plus, five plus to hit. Um, it's a really good episode and we did it very conversationally as well. So it's not like going to maths class in university. So um, maths, uh, Paul is a wonderful man when it comes to maths hammering. But uh, thank you very much for your time. I learned a lot. I, If I was a Nurgle player, I would feel rejuvenated and passionate about putting my Nurgle boys on the table. Got plenty of tools. I think got a lot of things to explore and who knows what Broken Realms is bringing to the table. Paul, thank you for your time. Thanks for having me. It's been fun. Mate, how good was that video? Surely it's going to go straight to the pool room. If you enjoyed that video, I would appreciate it if you crushed that like button. And if you have an opinion, leave it in the comment section. That lets YouTube know it's a great video and it should share it with other Age of Sigmar players. Cheers to all the bloody legends here on the screen who have financially supported AOS Coach on Patreon on YouTube members. Their contributions have helped me improve the quality, frequency, and the variety of content on this channel. So cheers, guys. You are bloody legends. Until the next video, don't forget to shoot the heroes and have a good one.